Thank <laughs> you. 
You can be seated. Pastor Steve, are you heading out? You're heading out? All right. Praise the Lord. Mr. Madden, you heading out? All right. Time to go. They're all ready. Praise God. It's all good. Hallelujah. Thank you for the welcome. It's wonderful to be back. You know, it's always good to go, and sometimes I, I look forward to the going, but I always look forward with great anticipation to the returning. Uh, it's, it's as if when I'm off, when I'm gone, uh, I'm, I'm, like, uh, I'm like a vagabond, I'm like a nomad, uh, wandering aimlessly, thinking I should be somewhere tonight uh, engaged in the presence of the Lord. And of course, I, not that I'm not continually, I was uh, thinking back this time last Wednesday night, I was at the World Series of Baseball, uh, for my grandson, and uh, you know, wow, what a great privilege and opportunity it was for us to be able to uh, to be with him and uh, see him pitch in a World Series game, and uh, it was wonderful. And uh, and to see uh, the hand of the Lord uh, upon his life, to see uh, coaches that desire to build Christian character in the young men. And I won't get into a whole lot of that tonight. I, but it, well, let, let me just say this: uh, I, I've told you about their their ministry. It's gone global. Uh, the Rounding Third Ministry has gone global. They uh, they were ministering to a group of guys that had come in for the World Series, and they were Hispanic. And uh, they began to mention Rounding Third Ministry, and the guy said spoke up in, in, in broken English and said uh, that. We already know about Randy Third Ministry. He said, Well, where are you from? He said, We're from Ghana. And he said, How do you know about that? And they said, The star major leader, Brian Dole, came over and shared with us about Jesus and to our baseball squad over there and told us about Randy Third in the States. So we already know about it. Tell us more because we want to start Randy Third Ministry in Ghana. So uh, it's cool. Sunday uh, at the World Series, there were 130 teams, something like uh, 2,000 people. And, uh, of course, they didn't minister to probably about half of them, about 1,000 people. But they saw 260 people give their lives to the Lord. Uh, players, coaches, parents, grandparents. It was a powerful, uh, powerful day. So, anyway, that's kind of what we were all about uh, for, the, for the week. And, and uh, wow. And so that part's exciting. Uh, getting to be with our family. And of course, they're all down here now. We went up there to be with them. Now they're down here to be with us. And, uh, Aaron and Becky just left for Switzerland. They're world travelers. So they'll be in Geneva by morning. So, uh, and, and now the grandparents get the happy privilege of taking care of the grandbabies for 14 days. Ain't that going to be fun? <laughs> Hallelujah. So, so we're 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 excited about what God has uh, has done. I, I was I'm I'm still pumped about uh, the last Sunday I was here, and then I hear Jeanette uh, led a wonderful Bible study last week on worship, and intimacy, and worship, entering in. Pastor Steve preached a powerful. Message Sunday. God is uh, God just moving around this place. Very significant, very, very powerful, powerful ways. I, I'm I'm excited about it. I really am. Uh, let's go let's go to the word of God tonight uh, for for the next few moments. Uh, and uh, do a little bit of delving into there it takes a little bit longer. Come on.
find my document here. There it is. Okay. Good. Several of us are still on vacation, I see. That's, uh, that's wonderful. I encourage folks to go, enjoy it, and come back home ready to go for God. Here we are. Praise the Lord. Now I want to get to this last segment. Going back to uh, what we were teaching on a few weeks ago, um, got one more, one more tenet. Uh, faith to share how God tests how God tests our faith we said that he's testing it through difficulties he's going to suffer trials of all kinds but that causes us to turn our thoughts and our hearts to God he may even test us in the furnace of affliction he tests our faith through demand um, and then he tests our faith through dollars um, to find out if we're trustworthy in handling the riches of, of the kingdom. Um, so I want to get to the fourth one tonight. This one is probably the most intriguing one and maybe the most difficult for us to handle. When God tests our faith with delays, when God delays, if every prayer were answered immediately, if every need was automatically met, if every problem instantly solved, you would not need faith. Your faith would not need to be stretched or increased. Disciples even asked that of Jesus. Lord, increase our faith. We have to wait on things. Human nature tells us we hate to wait. I'm always intrigued when I go through uh, the fast food line, whether I'm at Taco Bell or Wendy's or McDonald's or Checkers. Some, somebody's always trying to beat you, get ahead of you in the line. One of the things that bugs me at McDonald's is when people, there's the one out by my house at Socrum, says circle the building to get around to the entrance to the drive through and you can come in a back way and that's why they have you circle the building and go around so you get into the proper entrance and inevitably you know I'm I've already made up my mind I'm going to circle the building they asked me to circle the building I'm going to circle the building and I'll circle the building and just as I'm coming up to the drive through I'll meet somebody coming that goes oh there's nobody else there in the line I don't need to circle the building and they just cut right in in front of me. those are the ones in my flesh I, they can't wait and I would just want to go yank them out of the line sometimes you know or shoot out their tires just do anything. Sometimes I just get, I just get, just get you, you know. You think, don't you read the sign that says circle the building. Get in the line the proper way. They'll even run over the cones. They've got cones there and they'll run over the cones to get in line. The point is people hate to wait. We just by human nature don't want to wait. We hate it. None of us are like that. We're all, we're all peace-loving people. We can wait patiently. None of, that, none of that bothers us. The 
the encyclopedia of how long things take. I'm going to make a point that's going to set that up. When God tests our faith through delay, the encyclopedia of how, how long things take, Encyclopedia of Trivia. It takes six seconds to fold a terry cloth towel. Think of how much of your life you spend folding terry cloth towels. Just between the three of us, Madeline washes two or three loads of towels per week. She's folding away. It takes 10 seconds for a slinky to tumble down a flight of stairs. I did not know that. It takes 10 minutes for a snowflake to form. It takes 1 hour and 47 minutes to watch the movie Ishtar. Wasted minutes in your life. It takes 13 hours for weekly food preparation for the average of Interesting. It takes 24 hours for plaque to colonize on your teeth. Glad to know that, I'm sure. It takes 80 hours and 42 minutes to complete the household task in a family who have children under 12. You wondered why you were so tired. takes one week for bacon to lose its freshness in a refrigerator at 32 degrees. It's profound stuff, isn't it? Yeah, I can tell we're all thrilled about that. But these are the kinds of waiting things, the trivia of life, the little irritations that just get under our skin and just bug us to death. It's in the midst of these that we find God saying to us, I'm trying to grow you. I'm trying through these irritating things, through these times of waiting, uh, it, it, to grow you up and to mature you into the believer that knows how to wait. Waiting for something you never wanted to wait for. He grows us through the times, these times in our lives of testing, trial. A good biblical example is in the Old Testament. The children of Israel are on their way from Egypt to the promised land. Going from Egypt to the promised land, they could have made it. They could have traveled that distance in two to three weeks. But it ended up taking them, as you know, 40 years. Years. Why all the wasted time? Because the Bible says that God led them in their journey from Egypt to the promised land. Question, why all the wasted time? Because God was more interested in developing their faith. Hear it clearly. Because you and I ask the same question questions that the children of Israel were asking. Moses, why did you bring us out here in the wilderness to starve us to death and kill us? We have no food, we have no water, we have nothing. But you prayed for a deliverer. I'm he. You're now delivered. You've experienced your emancipation. You're free. You just aren't satisfied with anything. God is getting you from point A to point B the most quick way, the fastest way. It may take 40 years. There, the Bible says in Deuteronomy 8 2, get this God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to test you. Test you. God did that? Yeah. God led you in the desert these 40 years to test you in order, get this, in order to know what was in your heart. Is anybody getting the point? It is very important. 
important to learn that God always deals with the heart. He wants to know the condition of your heart, so it's better to just clean up your act to start with. You see, you've heard it said. He got the children of Israel out of Egypt, but he had to get Egypt out of the children of Israel. He had to know if their hearts were truly committed, truly yielded, truly obedient to Him. It's what happens in times of waiting. We get to see God, a God who gets to see what's in our hearts. Our problem God is not in a hurry. He's not in a hurry. Don't get, don't get in a hurry with God. I was, uh, I was, usually, I just, with my, with my children, I just pray over them. Let the Holy Ghost do what He needs to do which is what I did in this, in this situation. Our son, he's still with us at the house. And we love having him there, and we have great interaction with him, have a great relationship, love him, he loves us. And uh, he's just been after God. When I say after God, I mean spending time doing what I've been preaching the last three Sundays. He's diving deeper into the things of God. I mean... And I say going after God. He's got on praise music. The TV is rarely on. He's he's in he's he's got the word going, or he's got somebody that, that he's heard about that's really into the things of God, and he's got him up on his laptop in his room just watching and into the word and read the word and just going after the things of God because he's he all of this is preparing him for the call that God has on in preparation. This is preparation time, which it should be for all of us. But it's also a waiting time. God's been delayed. His mother will say to him, Son, I just want you to get a job. He said, Mother, one day God's going to give me the job that's going to support you. I'll be taking That's what he tells me. And you know what? I firmly believe he, that'll happen. And he believes that. But where I'm going with this is in the wait, in the in the delay, even with when people come against you and 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 say things to, to you that God is not saying. You, you've ever felt the pressure, the, the delay? You need an income, you need a job, you need this, and and when we hear other voices other than the voice of God, we get the knee-jerk reaction and we tend to react to what's being said to us from the externals rather than the internal voice of God. Others outside of us may be saying, oh, you've got to go for it now. The, the, and, and even people will say, "That's oh, that yeah, that's God. Four interviews for worship leaders at four major churches. One here in town, two in one in Tampa, one in Baltimore, one in San Diego. He had he had uh, this one, and I won't tell you which 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 town or so forth because I don't I don't want to I don't want to give anything else away because I'm making a point here of what it means to wait. And he had to pa- one of the four pastors. I've been in prayer. And God spoke to me this morning and said, You're the one. And he offered them him this enormous package of salary, benefits, he laid out the duties and responsibilities. He's the worship leader, the music director, the leader, all that stuff. And, and 
when I told you at the beginning of this illustration that I'd turned all of my children over to the Lord, I don't get involved in his business because I don't want to be another voice that brings confusion when he's trying to hear from God. Okay? So I just pray. Now I sit back. unseen. You've, there's no relationship. There's no bond. There's been no, other than you say you were down praying this morning and God spoke to you and said, this is the guy. So anyway, he says, uh, I, I'm going to come and I want to meet you and meet your staff and so forth. He was even over in Tampa a few weeks ago and went over and heard. Pastor's a great communicator, great guy. So he, he goes and, and, and meets the staff. Everything looks like it's going good. Worship happens on Sunday. All of that flows really well. And on Monday, he comes into the pastor's office and the pastor looks at him and says, You know, he said, I think I'm Are we going to, and and when I heard that, I said, aha. Now, here was the kicker. The pastor had asked him, well, what do you think? You've met the staff. You've heard what I said. I've offered you this position. All of this stuff, it looks good. It's just the big hype, the big buildup. Here's what Ryan says. Pastor, I have. Two days later, the pastor receives the offer. Following me? How important it is, is it to wait on the Lord? Had he jumped the gun and accepted the offer and decided to make the move and accept the position, but the pastor receives the offer, he's left the offer in the bag, and goes, then the other three. The voice of God and waiting upon the Lord would have all fallen by the wayside. So sometimes it's important because we, we can, we, you know, when we think, oh, isn't it wonderful? Four places want me to come. That's not the point. It's not four, that four places are looking at him to come be their worship leader. The point is, Where does God want me? What does God want me to do? And I'm not going to jump the gun. It doesn't matter how big the package. It doesn't matter how attractive it looks. It doesn't matter about all the bells and whistles and all the things that that make it look attractive. Until I hear from God, I'm not moving. I'm going to wait on the Lord. See? Because sometimes we think that waiting is delay. But waiting is a process. Because in the process, remember, those that wait, what happens? Renew your strength. Now what does that tell you? That waiting can be a cumbersome thing. It can drain you. That's why waiting, one needs to learn how to renew their strength. One needs to learn how to renew their mind. How to allow the Holy Spirit to bring about the process of transformation in their spirit. That's important. We're not just sitting around here idle, doing nothing. We 
are waiting for a response from heaven. You need a response from on high. And when you hear from heaven, and you get the go-ahead, or you get the, as we've said before, Dia said it aptly, the green light, then you know you can move ahead and proceed with the direction and the backing of heaven. He's leading the way. You're getting the guidance. But he's also, not only does he go before you, he goes behind you. So it's important that we are more interested in growing our faith and hearing from God than the big position, how attractive it looks, how much people feed our ego, outside voices, outside influences, that that inner voice of God. What did the prophet say? I was waiting to hear from the Lord. I thought it was in the wind. I thought his voice was in the fire. I thought he'd speak through the fire. He spoke through that still, small voice that I heard from the Lord. You see, by our, our flesh, by human nature, we want something grandiose. We want something superhuman, bigger than life. God just does things. Very faith oriented, very faith building, because he speaks into the peace of our soul. That's why have you ever heard people say, "I've got a peace about it." The reason they got a peace about it is because they waited on the Lord. When you have a peace, of, you know when you get that peace about it that you've waited on the Lord. Your faith has been tested. See, your faith will be tested in waiting. It's not that you're just you're just sitting here going, Oh, God speak to me when you get No. I'm waiting with anticipation. I'm waiting in expectation to hear that still small voice that gives me that the definitive response of faith. God Something that he extracts from his word by the Holy Spirit and anoint it to our hearts and minds that will grab hold of what God has said by his spirit and say, this is the confirmation of God. Now I can move. Now I can act on it. Oh, wow, I feel something happening. Hmm. That was probably the most difficult time of our of our marriage. I was learning to wait on the Lord. The two girls came along. We love them. Love them. Love them. Oh Lord. How we love those two girls. They've been the joy of our heart. For me, there was always something in my spirit that said, you know, on my dad's side of the family, if you don't have a boy who's named Horton, his legacy dies. Somehow, you can trust us. I asked for a son. Little did I know what I was asking for. Sometimes we ask for things not knowing what the end result will be. I asked. At the time, Madeline was very much opposed. She said, I've already gone into the jaws of death twice for you. And I refuse to do it a third time. But the Lord showed us 
us or showed me Ryan in a dream. And before Rhea was born, we had already picked out Ryan Christopher. It's a boy, he'll be Ryan Christopher. So I saw him in a dream. And I told Matt. or a son. She said, God may have showed you that in a dream, but he didn't show me. It's over. And it was a tough time for me of agonizing and waiting because in the wait, I had to say to the Holy Spirit, God, you're going to have to increase Madeline's faith so that both of us are in agreement and share in what you've spoken. And if it's really true, and it really, it's really your, your will, we'll wait. And a month went by, three months went by, six months went by, and in the sixth month, we discover she's with child. And we went through, with the other, with the two girls, we didn't do Lamaze. We didn't. We weren't going to do natural. We didn't do natural childbirth with them. They just, you know, back then it was, it was like having a cabbage patch doll. They just rolled you in. And you had the, the baby cabbage, and they announced it, and here you come out. You know, they got the baby with them. You know, I stayed in there and held her hand until they gassed her and took her in the room and come out. And, oh, there's your baby. You know, but with this, we have to go through a process. You know, learning how to breathe, learning how to, you know, how I had to learn how to coach. I was her life coach. I had to learn how to coach, what to tell her, how to help her through the pain, and how to comfort her, and how to do this, and how to do... We went through all those things. Learning how to hold the pillow. What, how to be in positions that would help relax you. We went through the whole deal. And in none of that time did we go, did we say, well, you know, God, we're going to jump the gun on you here. We're going to do amniocentesis because we want to know what the sex is. Or did we do, uh, you know, they did an ultrasound but still didn't reveal. In other words, we didn't know, boy or girl, we just said, if this is God, we're going to wait on God. She, she went in for a checkup in the ninth, ninth month, and the doctor said, your blood sugar is dangerously elevated. He said, I'm going to give you two weeks, and if you're not in labor by then, you know, it's going to be C-section, or we're going to induce labor, and we're going to just, this is not good for you. Two weeks she goes in, the doc says, you've solved your own problem. You're in labor. Go immediately to the hospital. Go to the hospital. The process starts. They put her on labor-inducing drug, and she stops having contractions. And the doc says, "Up, oh, we're going to have to do a C-section because we don't want to put the baby in distress. Still not knowing, boy or girl, it's in the hands of the Lord. Have we heard from so I'd already signed the papers for her to go in for the surgical procedure. For the C-section. They had stopped. They had stopped the labor-inducing drug, and it'd gone by about thirty minutes because it took that long for them to come in with the papers, read us everything that was going to happen, blah blah blah, and me sign off on it. Them get. The, they already had the doc in, had the surgical procedure ready to go. Everything was ready to go. They were ready to roll her in. As the doc comes in, ready to roll her in, boom, she kicks it in high gear in labor. The doc checks her one more time, calls the staff in there and says, get in here quick, she's ready to have this baby now. I mean, just that quick, within the span of 30 minutes. Now, in the midst of all that, 
I've got family in the waiting room, and we go in there and tell them it looks like it's going to be C-section. We join hands in the family waiting room and have prayer and touch the Lord and ask God, we don't want to go the C-section route. We went through Lamaze. We want to go through the natural childbirth route. Now, she doesn't even get to do the epidural thing. It's just, boom, we have prayer. I walk back in. She's having the baby. They don't have time to do epidural. Three pushes, and boom, and I'm looking, and I go, I'll never forget. I look, Ryan's out, and I go, it's a boy. We've waited on God, mind you. It's a son. But my rejoicing, being tried to be stolen from me because they whisk him away to the neonatal intensive care unit because he's still blue. We don't know what's going on. He's not supposed to be there. He's just He's in the neonatal. Looks like so far he's breathing good. He's going to, for now, he's okay. But we think he has a heart defect. We have to see him for sure. But God, this wasn't what I signed up for. But what can you do? Ask God. go deep. I had to dive deep. God, what are you doing here? And for the last 26 years, the Lord has continued to speak to me about the depth with which I go after Him and pursue Him is, is your heart truly after me? Is your heart It was, it was an Abraham scenario because God was developing faith and removing fear because, ladies and gentlemen, this is a process. Learning to walk by faith, you don't wave a magic wand, you don't say Shazam, you dive deep into the Word of God and the things of God and allow the Holy Spirit to to impart the Word of God to you through the application of the Word so that what that Word does is it totally permeates your entire being to the degree that you have no other alternative. There is no option B. You trust God. Where the enemy wants to dupe us is to think that we have some other humanistic way out. There is no other way. It's Jesus. It's Jesus alone. It's faith in Him. And what He teaches us is that when we develop that intimacy with Him, that we know His voice and we respond to it, that if He says, wait, We don't question him, we just wait. Settle down. I I said that a couple of times. I had a flashback this week. There was a couple of times some some things happened because when we're away, we're still kind of monitoring what's going on with with the family and how things are happening here and kind of staying abreast of all the stuff that's going on. And Madeline's, Madeline's apprehensive. Don't you think you need to? This? Don't you think you need to do that? I said, Madeline, calm down. I said, the body of Christ is in good hands. And I ain't talking about Pastor Steve, although he's done a remarkable job. 
I'm talking about the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. If the pastor can't trust you, trust you with the Trinity, the Godhead three one, who can he trust you with? He's going to take care of you. He's going to develop your faith. He's going to, he's going to guide you into the truth that you need to walk in. And all of this that he's trying to teach us, how about your heart? Are you willing to just settle down and obey what he's doing? Don't jump the gun. Don't get apprehensive. Just settle down. Now I'm telling you what I saw. The first two years were topsy-turvy. Everything got flipped. Eight months in open heart surgery and a year and a half later another open heart surgery. And we were just walking through. Eight, eight, eight catheterizations. On and on and on. Eye problems. He had an eye muscle problem. Is he going to have to have eye surgery? Uh, just on and on and on and on and on. And in that process, the Lord teaches us to wait on Him. Just settle down and wait. And we're not waiting here by, by just being lazy or by doing nothing. We're going after deeper things. We've got to hear from Him. You know why? Because what, we're, what, what the Holy Spirit showed us, we're up against the life or death. The enemy wants to steal your son. And are you going to stand in the gap for it? See, now he's at a place, he's after God himself. He's, he knows how to dive deep into the things of God. He knows how to go after God for the things he needs. If he ever has to have another surgery, guess what? It'll be his decision now. Daddy won't have to sign on the God of life. Because he's a young man. So far, he's decided, I'm going to trust God. We'll see where he goes, where God goes with him. But that's, that's 26 years later. In about two weeks, he'll be celebrating his 26th birthday. 27, that's right. You were there. I was just an innocent bystander. Just kidding. 27. My point is, do you see what God will do when we trust Him? That even if it's in the midst of... Don't, don't fret over delay because the enemy wants you to get up off of it. He wants you to have a knee-jerk reaction. We learned this in Mind of Christ. Two things. Are you going to react or respond? That's why one of our discipleship courses is respond. You don't react, you respond. If you react, it's probably in haste. It's probably too quick. You haven't given God enough time to season it. God has to season things in your life. Because some things that he's preparing you for, some things will have to go. Fear had to go. Before faith could really take over and begin to do its perfect, its, its perfect work that it's still doing. When I say things like the, the perfect work of, of faith, this is a process because I'm still being perfected in it. I've walked through things since then I thought impossible to walk through. But God, by the Holy Spirit, directed me. And the more things that I walk through obediently with the proper heart attitude, the more God can trust you with things. The more He will trust you. I mean, let's ask ourselves a question as a church. Where, as God grows things here, what will God be able to trust this church with? If He can trust you with more, He can send you more. If He can't trust you, He's not going to squander the riches of the kingdom with people who will waste it. So you have to learn the process of waiting on Him. When we were in a focus group with my sister and brother-in-law and the pastor, they, they happened to be in the focus group with the pastor of the church. And they were talking about waiting. And the pastor said, I'm so glad that I didn't have a knee-jerk reaction in 2008 
we had purchased property and we were going to sell the present location and build a new sanctuary on the present property. He said, had I had the knee-jerk reaction, and he said, the outside voices were telling me, your pastoral success will be defined by you erecting that new multi-million dollar sanctuary sitting on that new piece of property. And he said, had I not listened to God and waited upon God, I would have plunged this church into millions of dollars worth of debt that it could not have handled. But God said, wait. And guess what? He brought us completely out of debt. Today, as I speak, we are debt free. And now we're poised. There is another group. The Salvation Army wants to sell out their complex and purchase the complex that they're presently in. They now have a better piece of property on a prime time location of almost 25 acres. They're poised now to build a new sanctuary. Interest from 2008 to present went from 6.75 to 3.25. He said, I will save this church millions of dollars, but I would have plunged them into debt had I not waited upon the Lord. You see. But the outside voices were saying, this will define who you are. This will mean pastoral success for you. He said, I have to get to the place where I don't give a rip what other people think. I want to hear from God. Are y'all hearing me tonight? Sometimes you're going to hear, most of the time, all of the time, you're going to have to get to the place where outside voices, unless they're speaking the, the true word of the living God to you, that is a confirming word. you got to hear. But if God brings a confirming word through another believer. God will give you the latitude of delay. So that you know that you've heard clearly from him. You need to understand the word clearly. You need to hear clearly from him. So that you can respond appropriately to the leadership of the Holy Ghost. Is this making sense to anybody? Are you getting a hold of the revelation that I'm getting? And the illustration. All right. Okay. I'm just reviewing my notes and I'm looking back thinking, I told that very well. I did very well. Right on, right on. Oh yeah, here's one thing I left out. The thing that you're waiting on right now, it may be health, it may be family, it may be relationships. Be job. And you and we're talking delay. You've been waiting a long time. Know this. While you're waiting, God is with you. He does not leave you alone in the way. Many times we think, well, I'm so alone. I hear Christians say that. I'm so alone. I feel I feel so alone. I feel so left out. No, you're not. If God has delayed and God has asked you to wait, then, and, and I tell I tell teenage girls and teenage boys this, when they say, oh, it, this could be my last chance at love. <laughs> no. Don't sell out and don't compromise and don't settle for second best. It's not your last chance for love. Don't marry the first person that comes along unless God's given you the okay on it. I could go back with you and review the wedding file since I've been a lead pastor of, of the number of people that have sat in my office for marriage counseling. I've even had some calls. I had, I had one young lady call and said, uh, Pastor, um, uh, uh, the young man I've met is in the military. I'm in the military. 
and uh, we're fixing to ship out to Korea, and we want to get married right away. I said, uh, what does right away mean? She said, tomorrow. I said, then I'm not your man. I said, uh, unless we sit down and go through about six hours in God's word and, and season this thing with prayer and know that this is the will of God, I'm not your man. I love you. I, I know you grew up in this church. I, I care about you. The marriage lasted two years. Boom. Done. I've had couples sit across from my desk and say, Oh, we walk the lake together. We pray together. We have devotion together. We read the Bible together. And we're just so in love and we just want to be together and we want to get married. The Holy Spirit has given me a boldness now to say, You are a wolf in sheep's clothing. And you are not worthy of this young man. I love you, but God is looking at your heart. When you guys are sitting there telling me what you think I want to hear so that I'll sanction your marriage covenant under the under the authority and the hand of God and put and, and put a blessing upon your marriage and it's going to be cursed because your life is not a life that opens your heart up purely before the Lord. <coughs> I, I, I've had to get I've had to get bold with some, some, some people in that. Not that I wanted to be rude or callous or, or, or lack compassion, but but people will tell you anything these days. They'll tell you what you think they want. They come in and talk to the preacher. I've even had them come in. I, I, I had to deal with it. I had to deal with it. One, they came in and they said, well, we want to get married. It's wonderful, Okay. Great. Tell me about it. Well, we're kind of doing it backwards, Pastor. We had the kids first. <coughs> and while I'm counseling, we got two kids running all over my office. Just the sweetest little kids you've ever seen. Just as sweet as they can be. They're the innocent ones. They didn't, you know, hey. Eh? And I say to them, all right, because I, I was going to be, I, and I had to pray through the Holy Spirit about this because the, understand delaying it. I had to pray through about this. Do, do I counsel them what the Word of God says? Yeah, I can be rigid and tell them you birth two children out of wedlock. Okay, <coughs> or do I say to them? There is a God who loves you enough that he offers repentance to you that if you make a, a, a decision to go his way, you can have his blessing and his favor upon your life. Even though you've, you, you've made some unwise decisions and choices over here, you can get it back on track. And the Holy Spirit had to deal with me about that because I've, I've gone out here and read, read church policy on the internet. And there's there's pastors and denominations all over the place that are rigid on this stuff. If you don't meet the criteria, bless God, is he a virgin? Is she a virgin? Or but and I mean they go right down the list. Are you a member of this church? Are you have you been loyal? Do you tithe here? Do you this? Do you this? They walk you through a whole time. I mean, it it makes the Ten Commandments look like a picnic in the park. And I mean, they walk you through a bunch of stuff. I've read them. I've got them, in, I've got them on file. Because I've went down and stuff, and I'm thinking, well, yeah, we need to, I mean, because what are we What are we doing here? What are we sanctioning here? And you know, I've had to ask myself the question, well, Pastor, are you just soft on sin? Do you just let people live any old way they want to live? And then come in and, and, and because, are, am I doing them, a, doing them a disservice if I say, Sure, go ahead and live any old way you want to. God's going to bless you for it. Hallelujah. Or do I tell them what the truth of God's word says in a loving, caring, compassionate way so that they can now have the opportunity to, to correct what's gotten off, off track? The Holy Spirit dealt with me on that and I made the decision to do that. I counseled them. I married them. And for a time, 
about a three month span, they were doing wonderful things. Going after God, going after the deep things of God, correcting the course where they've gotten off track, getting back on track, and then they let her slip. And they let her slide. And today, they're on skid row. God had blessed them with a new car, blessed them with a new house, blessed them both with good jobs. Their children had got scholarships to go to school here. All of this, just the favor of the Lord. You could see it, it was the favor of the Lord just ministering. And God was just showing himself faithful in the midst of all of this. And then they decided they didn't want to. They didn't want to come back. Lost the house. The engine in the new car blew up. Had to move back in with his parents. And don't have enough money to get by to this day. And thousands of dollars in the red. Why? Faith. Where do you anchor your faith? It's not just, I'm not just telling you a, a scenario here that says, oh, well, this, this poor couple, they're so misguided. No, they were guided. Okay? But every person has to make the decision. Am I going to go after the faith that God wants to develop in me? And in that process, he's going to test me in it. To see if my heart is really after him. Because, see, we want to look on the surface of the scenario and say, oh, poor person, you this poor little couple. I'm not minimizing that because they're hurting and they're struggling right now. As a matter of fact, they just sent me an email just before I left on vacation asking me to help bail them out of a tough financial situation they're in right now. And I still have to make a decision on how I'm going to respond to that. Because I've been praying about it. What needs to happen? Because God is testing you. And some of it comes when God delays. So if God is delaying in your life, and God is delaying in areas of your life, learn that the delay is for your good, not your harm. Learn that God is trying to test so that He, the quicker you get your heart in alignment with what He wants, you've got to come into agreement with what He says. And then when he begins to surface things in your heart that says, this can't stay, this has to, well, let me name some, some specifics. Pride has to go. Envy has to go. Covetousness has to go. Selfishness <coughs> has to go. All, and he begins to surface things in your, in your life, then Part of that waiting or delay process is so that you can deal with those things and bring yourself into the alignment of, of, of what the Holy Spirit wants to impart into you because what faith will build is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, meekness, temper, all of those things so that the fruit of the Spirit then can manifest maturity in your life. And that's so powerful. Because what people don't understand is they think, well, I just don't have the discipline to get there. Yes, you do. God will get you there. And he's going to get you there. Remember last Sunday I was here, I preached Sunday before last? He's, you may be in a rip current, but God's going to drag you back out in the deep. He's pounding you with those waves. All of your ability. You know, we're going to have, well, the devil this and the devil this. No, it's God. He's taking you into the deep things. You can't live shallow anymore. You can't live according to the weak and beggarly things of this world. You won't, you'll just barely scrape by by the skin of your teeth. And that's thin stuff that beds. You will, and it's going to be tough. These kids I just described to you are suffering. And I look at both of them and they're mentally, they're smart, they're intellectual. They've got, you look at them and you go, God. If they would just get on the track that you have for their lives, they have they are filled with potential. Full of it, that they could just do so much for God. Not that 
like God just blesses us, you know, and just starts dumping blessing on us so we can be a success. Even, and we're going to teach on this in a few weeks, even when God calls you, wherever He stations you or assigns you to, to do whatever profession you're in, that's your calling. That's your ministry field. That's your mission field. That's your harvest field. And God's going to develop faith in you there. I was, I was talking with, with my brother-in-law just last night. And he he's so... He, he's always been hungry for God and to dive deep into the things of God. But he, he's, he, he was questioning, does, does anybody where I work see? See the light of Christ. See that I'm salt and light. And as I begin, he began to share a couple of scenarios. And how powerful it, 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 it was in this particular scenario that he's befriended a guy that's in an unnatural affection lifestyle. And he's loving him unconditionally. Where this guy, and I'm talking about a guy that, that's an intellect. When I say intellect, I mean he can speak two sentences and, and you think, my God, where did he get all this? I mean, it just blows your mind. And my brother-in-law was saying, well, I'm wondering, I'm wondering if I, and I said to him last night, I said, do you see that you've been, in the last two to three years, you've been in three different positions, and everywhere you've gone, somehow this guy followed you there, or you followed him to a position he went to? Do you think that's coincidence? That's God. That's God at work. And I said, do you understand that the reason he wants to hang around you is one, because you love him unconditionally, two, because he sees the light coming out of him. That when you're in his presence, the entire environment of his world changes. The presence of the Lord. The process of faith is built. And he doesn't even know. Even, even to the degree that there was a this, this young man was abandoned by his father at age five. See, if you look with faith, the eyes of faith, part of the eyes of faith will give you the gift of discernment. And when you hear somebody's testimony and you begin to look back, why is this person where they are? You know, because the church wants to look and say, oh, you're this or you're that. You're guilty of sin. Why was Jesus going around saying, oh, you that are without sin, you go ahead and pick up the first stone. You'd be the first one to do this lady. Yeah, I know. She's been sleeping around. That's what she's accused of. But what could we find if we look hard enough at your closet? What could we find that you messed up? Hmm? He said, any of you that are any of you that have reached the state of perfection and you're sinless, you go ahead, hit her in the head first and take her out. You deliver the death blow. Not just physically, but spiritually. You go ahead and take them out. Are y'all getting this? Because faith requires more of us than just this surface stuff. It requires us when we interact with each other to dive down deep and go after the heart of God in a matter. It's shaping me to pastor this church differently. To go after the heart of God concerning you. You know? I wanted to, I mean, I, we had a great altar service the Sunday before last. And the, the Holy Spirit was moving and, and there were a bunch of burdens lifted and, and the Holy Spirit was speaking and great things were happening and God was moving in, in very profound ways even to the degree that God was divinely setting some people up. And I knew it. 
I knew what was going on. Some people are being you know, some people come in here and, and they may act all spiritual and they may do all kinds of different stuff. And God will set them up to where the words that they speak become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And sometimes the things we prophesy, we better know that we've waited on God and we've heard from God and that we're not doing just, just doing something to be in competition with something else that's going on. I'm talking about faith because God says you better wait and you better test the spirits and you better try them to know that they're of God. This is important. That I, I don't just I don't just run in here and have a knee jerk reaction where I say, "Oh, I got to preach a stem winder or a message." No, I've got to hear from God. I've got to dive down deep into the things of God because what I want to give you is a word that's from the Lord, not a word from Pastor Randy, a word from the Lord that I heard, heard the voice of the Lord, that I've waited upon God, that I've that I've prayed over it, that I've struggled with it, that I've wrestled with it, that I've agonized over it, that, that I know that this is what God is saying to this body. I know he's saying, if we'll call, he'll answer. I know he's saying he's going to show us great and mighty things. We're already into it. That's why when I went to church Sunday, and the pastor there, who's a friend of mine, had just gotten back from two weeks in Israel. And he's preaching out of 2 Kings where the woman that had the this, this son and, and, and Elijah comes in and says, bake me a cake. And she says, there's nothing in the house, I, but I've got a little bit of oil. And we're going to die. We're going to bake a little cake. We're going to eat it. We're going to die. And when you hear what the prophet says, the prophet says, I hear what you said. Make me a cake first. Are you out of your mind? You're going to, prophets, you're going to eat the widow's and her son's cake? And they, they, they're going to eat it and die. The prophet says, make me the cake first. He says, now, you said you, said you, had, a, you had a cruise of oil in the house. Go around to everybody in the community that you can and get containers and have them bring it to your house. And then take the oil and start pouring. And she poured until every one of them were full. The point where he went with this was he said, he said, he said, when the prophet said to that woman, go throughout the community and gather up containers that will hold the anointing. He said, you, the reason the community was involved is so that they could bear witness to, listen to this phrase, he said, the miracle in the making. The Holy Spirit took me back to last August and said, do you think that I stopped the miracle in the making that I gave you? With the ending of an event, he reminded me that this was an ongoing process. And he's not finished with the completeness of it yet. He said, you may have stopped looking for it, but I have not stopped. And he said, if you want, all you have to do is open up again. He said, because as long as she tipped that cruise of oil up and continued to pour oil poured out until every vessel was full. What do you got? He, then the Holy Spirit said, what do you got in your house? I've come back with a new desire. What do you got in the house? Because there's a miracle in the making. Here. Here. And the Holy Spirit said, he said, Go down and let that pastor transfer that miracle of the making anointing that's on him on to you. And I hit that altar, and the Holy Spirit broke stuff inside of me. He broke stuff off of me. And, and, and he broke some doubts off of me. 
he broke some more unbelief. And I thought, oh, this is this is too big for God. This is too hard for God. We're just gonna have to struggle through it. God says, Oh no, you're not gonna struggle through it. I'm gonna show you the miracle. What do you got in the house? What do you got in the house? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Delay is the process of testing our faith. All right? He said, I didn't stop. You stopped. I said, Lord, I'll never stop again. I won't stop. I'm going deeper. I knew there was a reason why he was yanking me out. I've been in a spiritual rip current for the last three months. I mean, he's just been yanking Say, God, why are you taking me here? Because I want to show you things you've never seen before. I want to do things through you that's never been done before. And it's happened. You know why? For people, and the pastor of that church, he and I were talking at Landry's ball game Saturday night. He said, he said, what grieves my spirit, the more churches I go into and visit, is that that Pastors and elders and leaders in churches will not release the presence of God. They want to hold it back and control it. They won't pastor the presence of God and let Him flow. Let Him flow. Remember, I said to you, let the Holy Ghost do His job. That's been revelation for me. Let the Holy Spirit do His job. When people start. Well, I don't think it can happen. This. I think we need to do this, or we need to let the Holy Spirit try to do His job. He said this to us in the message. Charisma Magazine came to him and said, "We want to do an interview on your church. We're interviewing pastors of the five fastest growing churches in America that nobody knows anything about. They've been hidden, but we're going to give you exposure. Tell us for the interview. We're going to push publish it in Charisma Magazine." What has been the key to your church growth and your church success? Pastor's words, not mine. He says, I looked at the, I looked at the interviewee and I said, I really can't tell. I don't know. I don't have a clue. He said, all I know is we've been after the presence of God in ways that have been unprecedented since I've been a Christian. We've been going after the deeper things. And he said, miracle after miracle after miracle. Miracles of healing, miracles of finance. This is the same pastor. My kids go to his church. The same pastor that was called to a local restaurant. And a couple sat across the table from him and said to him, Pastor, God is doing unprecedented things in this church. And he's marked this church for greatness. And he's marked this church to do things around the world, to touch the nations of the earth. And we want to be part of what God's doing. Here's a check. Take it and use it in, min in the ministry to develop the ministry that God's called you to do. He said, when I looked at the check, it was for $4 million. And I got the of the check. He said, we paid off every indebtedness. Today, they've gone downtown and bought, and bought an independent Baptist church that was dead on the Holy Ghost. That back in the 70s ran a bus ministry and was running over 10,000 people. And when bus ministry went by the wayside, the church went from 10,000 down to 175. Nothing left. They went in and bought that campus. Last January, God broke a revival out in that church that went to the end of May. Five months of nothing but solid outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Week after week after week after week after week after week. Just going. Then they went across the street. Right across the street from, from that church was a whole university called Tennessee Temple University. They were relocating and all of those buildings became available for sale. Guess what? God supplied the money again, and they went in and bought the whole Tennessee Temple campus and paid cash. 
and everything they have now is debt. And guess what? They just hired Pastor Kevin's mentor from Twin Rivers Church in St. Louis. He will start the first week of August as the first president of their school of ministry, a Bible school that's going to be for pastors and lay pastors and lay leaders to come there and be trained and raised up to be powerful men and women of God under an anointing. And he said this, why is God doing this? Just because he wants to put a bunch of money on us so we can get out of here? He said, I would, I would have been under so much pressure I couldn't have handled it. He said, what God has said to us is if our hearts will remain pure, he will withhold nothing from us because he knows that we will pastor it and we will steward it with the right motive, the right heart. Are y'all getting this? I'm telling you this because what will Sunrise Church do? God spoke to me Sunday and said, there's a miracle in the making for this place. There's a miracle in the making happening here now. Now are we going to see it? And are we going to have the right heart? And let, let's see what God does. What do you think? All right? Hallelujah, Daniel. Oh, you're just saying thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Y'all receive it tonight? I receive it. I'll tell you what I received this Sunday because I, when the Holy Ghost got through with me, I was on the floor for about an hour. I did some carpet time. All right? But it's good. Praise the Lord. Holy Spirit, pour it out. Pour it on us. We're your miracle in the making. We wait on you. Father, we don't want to have knee-jerk reactions. We're going to respond to the clear, clarion call from your word. And when you say move, we'll move. When you say wait, we'll wait. Lord, we want to be, we want to be in that posture of being led by the Holy Spirit. Guided, directed by the Holy Spirit. That we might fulfill the purpose and mission that you've ordained, not only for our, our personal lives, but collectively for the body of Christ and on the Sunrise Church. We believe and we expect the fulfillment of the miracle of the making that you released among us at this point. This time, this time. That Jesus may be his own glory. All we need. Praise you for it. We honor you. We give you glory. Let us never operate out of a posture of selfishness, self righteousness. Let our hearts be pure and our spirits be obedient to what your spirit is saying to this church. Jesus, let it happen. We will promise you, we will give you all glory. All honor and all praise. Amen. Goodbye.